This is part 11 in a series of videos in which I am developing a magnetic core memory system. If you've seen the previous videos in this series then you'll know that I've gone through quite a lot of development work with this system and that this series of videos is to promote a book that I'm about to release on this subject and uh, which in fact goes through this entire process in much more detail than these videos. Before I start this video, I just want to respond to what is probably the most boneheaded comment I've received since starting my YouTube channel. I started this channel about four years ago now, and really it was just to promote a book I'd written at the time. And um, it was a very poor video, didn't go into any detail, it was just simply to uh, promote the book and show that it was available. Now this commenter and decided to state that I was being immoral and unethical in using my YouTube channel to promote anything. Now that's fairly ironic considering that my YouTube channel is one of the very few that's not monetized. That is, I don't make any money whatsoever from creating these videos and uh, they cost me thousands of pounds every year to produce. Um, it cost me thousands of pounds and thousands of hours more in the mostly free repairs I carry out while making the videos and um, you're not forced to sit through endless uh, adverts while watching my videos completely uh, non-monetized so there's no adverts and so I feel quite entitled uh, to promote things I'm working on that's part of the reason this channel exists uh, so I went over to look at his channel and as expected no content whatsoever and as I've said in the past, it's always the people with least to say that complain the most. So if you are offended by uh, occasional references to things that uh, I'm trying to promote, then uh, I won't be offended if you don't want to watch the videos. Um, but there will be occasional uh, content that is purely to promote projects that I'm working on. Some are non-profit, some I'm trying to make a bit of money on just so I can fund these videos. Um, but for the most part I make absolutely nothing from these videos whatsoever uh, but I do appreciate um, feedback and, uh, and comments and subscribers and uh, if you like the videos then please give a thumbs up at least I know then um, I'm on the right track with regard to the content um, but if you're not interested in the videos just don't watch them okay so back to the subject um, for this video which is the core memory system so where we are at the moment is I'd gone through development and started off with um, going through the core material and the cores are quite large for this type of memory system but still extremely small. Okay so there are 512 cores in this bag and uh, as you can see they are very small and um, this is for a, a 64 byte system each byte being 8 bits so we have 512 cores in total and during the initial development I was demonstrating a 4Y system so we had the X, the Y, the inhibit and the sense wires and then later on I showed how that could be reduced to a 3 wire system so again single core on here uh, but 3 wires now with the inhibit and the sense function being combined and then later on I went through and showed the difficulties that started to be created as more cores were added because obviously the system is in a grid array it's not a single wire single core arrangement so some wires have in fact every wire has 64 cores on it but they're woven in such a way that not all um, 64 cores are on common wires um, so there's a, a kind of variety of um, loads and inductances that are encountered by the driver electronics. From that point on I developed a trigger control which is intended to make the system look a bit like an SRAM so it can automatically uh, perform the required internal reads and writes in response to things like memory address changes and that sort of thing. And then from that point I went and developed uh, the initial control circuits so this is just for one core so um, there, there isn't one of these per core but there is one per wire so this is the control side of it 
and then from that I had to develop the actual driver circuits and that's actually where most of the development work went. This turned out to be quite a difficult task for two reasons. The first is because it's quite a difficult thing to do anyway. We're trying to drive uh, currents with uh, very fast rise times, quite high currents with fast rise and fall times, short duration pulses into inductive loads and we're also at the same time and sometimes on the same wire trying to detect very small signals down to 10 or 20 millivolts. And so the development of this um, became quite complex especially when we moved to the, um, the multi-core setup when there was lots of cores all interacting on common wires and so most of the time for this development has been on the uh, drivers for the wire. I then went on and built a prototype board which is the one that you've seen previously and um, by using this to experiment with and develop and it's very difficult developing on breadboards this sort of system because the breadboards behave very differently from the uh, circuit board design so you have to kind of factor that in when you're working out values. Uh, so I've now uh, gone from this to what is a, a more final version of the board and uh, that's what we're going to look at in this video. Okay so this is a more complete board I've moved on from the development board made some uh, fairly minor changes the uh, logic control was fine didn't need changing at all um, but I had to make some changes to the way the drivers operated to enhance their performance um, Basically they, were, they weren't switching off fast enough and um, that was interfering with the way that the cores were being driven so I modified that. They now turn on and off in about 20 nanoseconds so that's uh, quite good and um, it does appear to be getting fairly close to working. The only real question mark now is whether I use um, some preset pots for various adjustments. I may well add those just to make the board a bit more universal so it might be possible to use this board to drive existing cores rather than making up the one that it's actually designed for. And um, the real critical adjustments are the uh, threshold setting for the sense amplifiers and the timing so there might be um, maybe 10 uh, preset pots in the final version of the board. I haven't quite decided yet it does seem to be quite a wide uh, range in terms of uh, acceptance but we are talking here about very small signals so to make sure that uh, you don't have problems if you do decide to build one of these I may well change the fixed resistors I have on this board to uh, a series of uh, parts so it can be adjusted if required. So that said this board is now pretty much working I've got uh, all the drivers all the uh, sense amplifiers working. It's currently powered up. I've initialized a few of the memory address spaces to zero. So the way that I'm testing this, this breadboard has got uh, obviously eight LEDs on it. The white wire controls the um, read-write line. When the board is putting data out onto the address, onto the data bus, then it drives the LEDs. When the breadboard is putting data into the memory card then the LEDs represent the settings of the jumpers that we're using to set that data. It's a bit confusing but I'll, I'll explain what it's displaying uh, as we go along. So at the moment um, we have the board in read mode so the clock is running and I'm currently feeding this with an external a clock to drive the updates. Normally you would drive this from a memory select line on the host machine but to save me having to keep pressing um, a button every time I want an update um, this is just a series of pulses coming from the signal generator. Um, but it's, not, it's only used to trigger the cycle, it's not used for uh, any other internal processes, all the internal timing is generated on the board. Okay, I've just gone through and written uh, zero values to a few of the memory locations. 
so we'll just examine those I can do that by strobing the memory start line uh, after selecting the address that we want so we'll look at the first address and that's zero we'll go to the next one also zero next one zero and finally so I've set those four addresses to zero what we can do now of course is set them to uh, any value that we want I'll just uh, change one of the bits and we'll now write this to the memory location okay so that's now written to memory location zero if we go to a different memory location we should of course read zero which we are doing we'll try another of the locations we set to zero that's also reading zero we'll go back to the one we've just set the bit on and as you can see that's reading fine we'll select a different memory address we'll set a different uh, bit pattern there so we'll set a couple more bits on and now we'll set that to that value and once we've done this it doesn't matter where these jumpers are they're only used when we're setting the data so I'll just return those to zero so these the jumpers are now on zero but we can now read the memory uh, values that we've set so if we go to the first memory location I'll set address zero we'll scrub the memory notice the bit we set is on we'll go to one of the other addresses that's still on zero and we'll go to the address that we've just set and you can see those bits are still set so the memory is now working it um, will we can store and retrieve data in any of the 64 bytes uh, as I say this is now at the point where I'm just making some final decisions as to how the final board will be laid out uh, but as you can see it is working um, also part of the development I was doing was to try to reduce the average power consumption and uh, at the moment this board is drawing 226 milliamps at 5 volts single 5 volt rail of course that was part of the initial design uh, criteria that I wanted to try and adhere to to make it easier to uh, use this system as a, a demonstration system uh, you wouldn't need multiple supplies as you do with most core memory systems uh, but the issue I had initially was the um, the line drivers, the wire drivers were fairly inefficient so even driving uh, a single pair of lines the system was drawing over 900 milliamps at 50 kilohertz, that's 50,000 uh, refresh cycles per second. Um, now at 100 kilohertz the uh, current draw if all eight lines, that's all eight inhibit and two line drivers that's the most it's ever going to drive at any one time uh, are all active at the same time the average current draw at 150 kilohertz is around 320 milliamps so uh, obviously it's well within the capability of the onboard regulator and um, it's a, a very reasonable amount especially considering that the logic uh, TTL devices alone draw 180 milliamps so it's quite an efficient system uh, there is of course no shielding on this so if you do put a magnet near it then it's going to uh, erase all your data and um, it's not really meant as a, a fully fledged uh, system but um, what we'll do in the next video is hook it up to a Z80 and um, see if we can use it in a real system as uh, actual RAM but um, if you're interested in these they will be available on my website fairly soon as a set of bare boards so basically will be the main board uh, the array board uh, set of cores some suitable wire cover and the plastic bolts and the rest of the parts you should be able to pick up fairly easily they're all relatively standard parts um, if you've got any questions on this or any comments then um, please let me know but uh, as you can see we're now getting fairly close to a fully functional magnetic core memory system.